Alright. So we actually have two packages today, but only one that hasn't been opened already. Uh, somewhere in there. This to the pile. This is already opened, and you know I got one sent to rise. This is the deluxe edition, which uh, pretty much just means it comes with a couple of extra in-game things that don't really change things. Just cosmetic items. Anyways, this is actually really interesting because you know this looks like your normal One Piece release, but as you can see from there, this is actually a Blu-ray release, and. What that basically means is, first of all, I was confused because when I first opened it, I saw that I'm like, oh, they're doing images on the inside, but no, it was just an insert. If we look at like this, we have two disc ones now. Blu-ray, DVD. Blu-ray, DVD. And, you know... This two is the same. It did not feel like that closed correctly. But yeah, season 11, Voyage 1, Blu ray and DVD. Next up, we have Fruits Basket, Pile of the Fruits Basket, Season 2, Part 2. I started watching Season 2, but I didn't get very far, did I? My anime watching is just so. All over the place. This whole thing. Let's see. Because this is, uh, you know, season two collection, limited edition features. Basically, you know, this is going to be. I'm pretty sure I don't need to keep this. And I'll actually put it aside. Because here we should have the, um, uh, the Zodiac stones. And I do believe I keep these outside of that. So I'll just take a look at Monkey. Go back to monkey. Uh, that looks like I was going to say rabbit, but that's uh, chicken. I was going to say it would be really weird to get the um. And that's a sheep. Mm. We've got art cards. And it feels like. It feels pretty heavy, so I think there's actually a lot of them. Uh, there's something at the bottom of all this that is not art card, just because it is that. Um, yeah, I, I, I might store these. So I'm trying to figure out how to show these, because this, there's a lot here, and they're not separating. But we might as well go through all of them. Take a look. It's in that book. Green rain. Lots of cards. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of cards. I was just liking the reds and blues of that one. Most of these are really neat. Oh. I'm just thinking that one seems like it was used for box art, maybe. Uh, 
Okay. Only a lot of them. And it was interesting that they were very protected by the cardboard. Hopefully that won't be needed anymore in the future. Like I said, I can't insert this in here if it doesn't close. Now we can finally take a look at the release itself, which is region A plus B. Now, now that I mention that, what about one piece here? I think that it looks like it's region A only. Worth noting. And then let's see, you know, of course we've got, it looks like the dub, of course. It'd be unfortunate if they stopped in the middle of all of it. Manga, I think. I see the word manga there. Fruits basket, another. Mm. And we had Blu rays and DVDs three and four. Cast the characters. Yeah, this could be on top. Next up, we have Kondagawa Jet Girls. Something about this looks a little familiar. But I'm not sure what. Something about the art style. Oh dear. I'm getting lots of messages. What it's wild, and these girls are crazy for it. Got region A, got an English dub. It says uncensored, so I'm actually going to just open it very carefully. You yeah, know, but you know, just but the girls. And last but not least, we have Bang Dream third season. It feels like a bang green something showed up recently. And I don't think it was this, but whatever. Um, you know, looking on the back, region A only, uh, a Japanese with English subtitles only. Playing against a revenge band. Hmm. Most of my thoughts are that. If it's a subtitle only, maybe it's releasing faster than I'm used to, and so I just remember the season two release or a uh, movie release or something. Anyways, here's this week's anime DVD collection update. Well, before I go on, it turned out this was loose and there was more artwork underneath it. Alright, good amount to talk about. Um, we'll start with Bofuri. I did not watch all of it, I did watch all of the first disc. Um, part of the reason is, of course, Monster Hunter, but, uh, you know, talking about this, it's an okay show. Um, it kind of has a weird mixture of dumb things, like, you could just talk about the dumb things the show does all day long, but it also does fun things, and so it just kind of balances out to being okay. You know, some people are going to be less perturbed by the dumb things, and some people are not going to enjoy the fun things as much, so, you know, you know there's going to be... A wide variety of opinion on this one, I would think. But for the most part, I thought it balanced out pretty well, such that you're like, yeah, yeah this is kind of fun. Um, I think the reason it kind of doesn't work out too well. So, I've talked before about shows that, um, you know, they need to give people a reason why to watch it. And the you know, what the show is supposed to be about, what's supposed to bring somebody back curious and interested, and this show kind of does a pretty good job of that, except... Okay, so, um, basically, you watch it and you, you get the impression, okay, this is about an MMORPG, and our main character is, um, you know, the one right there with the shield who obviously is maxing her defense, 
So it's like, okay, she's kind of new to this, but she's also breaking the system. So you're basically kind of watching the show to just see kind of the just general funness around that. And it establishes that pretty early on, and you're like, okay, so I have a pretty good idea when I'm going to watch it. And a really good example of kind of the dumb thing that it does is you got the friend, and I don't remember if I remember the name right. I think it was like Sally. Something simple or something like that. So, um... Whenever the show uses her, it feels like it changes... Like the name of the anime should instead be my friend maxed out her defense and broke the game and now I have to work my ass off to do it. Like, the the show seems to completely change to we have to focus on her as being the main character. And it's really weird. Like, it kind of knows it doesn't, but it, it almost, every time that she's being used, the show's like playing like it always wanted her to be the main character. And it's like, oh, well, I guess I had to make this interesting character who maxed out her defense instead. And I think a really good example of just how, you know, this is one of those dumb things the show does, which kind of undermines, okay, we actually want to see Maple doing fun stuff, but, you know, it, it kind of wants to introduce cool characters, and maybe it's not thinking too much in terms of, is this really presenting to what we were hoping people would see. Because they didn't even make it about, oh, this is serious MMORPG dungeon crawling. And these two characters are probably a really good example because they're kind of set up in a way where, you know, and I'm trying not to spoil too much information, but um, they're like, you the viewer are like, okay, yeah, it sounds like they've done something kind of crazy too, but it's a craziness that should mix very well with our main character and her absolute defense. And... Basically, when they should be introducing that relationship with our main character, instead they're like, oh, well, we need to bring these characters to a specific place, so we have to go through this boss that they actually already went through previously, and from a storytelling perspective, you should only be doing that if you're specifically choosing to bring something to the table. Like, you don't even have to focus on that, you can just say, oh yeah, we got them past it, but they're like, no, we want to show them being taken to that boss, but it wasn't even a about our main character and these new characters and maybe some sort of interesting dynamic forming then. Instead, it was pretty much just about how Sally is now good enough to solo the boss. And that's just an example of the show sabotaging its own ability to kind of do what it's putting forth as what would be the interesting gotch about the show. But, you know, it's stumbling. I mean, it's, it'd be really easy to talk about all the dumb things this show does, and that one is kind of the biggest example that seems to occur, and it's just like, she's a cool character, but she's distracting from the reason that they sold us on wanting to watch the show, so. Oh, well, you know, not, not all shows are perfect. Um, I was thinking there was maybe also an issue where, you know, again, too many dumb things you could talk about this anime if you really wanted to. Uh, this one's probably notable just because every once in a while it seems like they very deliberately have an, oh, we didn't mean for that to be so broken. You know, the game developer's mindset's being, we didn't mean for that to be so broken. Um, or for people to abuse that or whatever. And, you know, you kind of watch it thinking, well, it's fun to see our main character doing it, but in real life, people would have been abusing that stuff from day one because people would have been fi figuring a lot of that stuff out. And it's definitely, it weakens the fun factor when you're having a character do these kind of unconventional things when in reality, even if most people wouldn't be doing the unconventional things, you would still have a lot of people doing it because you have people who specifically look for this sort of stuff. The show's just kind of 
conveniently ignoring some of that stuff, some of the game design principles to tell kind of its own thing. And it's weird, but again, you know, it's it's a balance. That's why I'm saying it's okay, because, you know, it the fun balances out the dumb, in my opinion. But it, as you can tell, some people will be really turned off by some of this stuff. And now I think about it, the other thing, the two things I was going to talk about are actually over here. So let's go grab them. Um, we'll take this and put this here, because one of them is One Piece Season 11 of Voyage 1. So, you know, obviously I dig this out because my Friday friend is really into watching this, and, you know, it's kind of interesting because I would say content-wise it was okay. Um, I get the impression that I am starting to get One Piece fatigue. Not that that's a specific thing, but rather I'm feeling fatigued watching a lot of it. It's... Not that it doesn't have interesting stuff, but it is just that watching this stuff, it feels like it's, um, you know, I, I kind of ask the question, is, is it actually doing stuff? Is it just, because, you know, One Piece is kind of whimsical and does stuff as it goes along, but at this point I kind of feel like it's been so long since we've heard some of the early story beat hints that kind of had us curious about stuff and it's you know nowhere near doing that sort of stuff it started doing some other additional stuff and world building stuff and it's not necessarily bad but it, sometimes it's just like Luffy's having this confrontation with these people that are like, oh, um, is this actually going to be important? Because it feels like the show is intentionally creating a bunch of interesting characters and spending a lot of time with them, but they're not spending time with the Straw Hat Pirates. It just kind of feels like it's making characters for the sake of making characters, kind of. And maybe it'll change. It's really hard to tell with One Piece, but for some reason I'm just feeling it more this time than usual. Um, maybe feeling like there's a hint of one or two things that they're a little off. So, for example, oh, they're on an island with a bunch of big plants. Well, some of them are on that island. And um, Usopp's being very standard Usopp, but you would think that he would actually be a little more well adjusted to that sort of thing just because he spent a lot of time on a very dangerous island full of giant plants. Maybe not to the same degree that these things were, but... And, you know, that could be the opposite because, you know, Usopp could just be like, oh, this, this, I did big plants, but not these big plants, so I don't know. But, you know, it's stuff. And it could very easily be building into something very big and notable. Because, you know, not only does One Piece surprisingly do that sometimes, but um, this one does have the feel of they're getting closer to something even bigger than stuff that they were doing before. And it doesn't feel like it's wasting time as much as, like, the CP9 stuff on the train um, stuff, which is just sort of like, you know... It, I think for that one, One Piece usually works because you kind of feel like the environments there and are pretty big. And when it's a small train and it's just like, oh, well, they're battling one person at a time or something as they go. It's just like, this feels like they very intentionally created a situation for people to be in this small situation. And, you know, it is what it is. Another part part of it was, is also, another potential part of it is just that, um... I was pushing myself pretty hard on Friday. Partially in order to watch that, partially because there was stuff to do. So like, yeah, that's right. I guess before I talk about Monster Hunter, I should probably talk about Blast Master Zero. And uh, you know, overall, I actually thought it was a pretty good game. Uh, I agree with my brother about the original music being some of the hardest to do. It's some of the best video game music out there. You know, and you might have different opinions. You might not like the Square Wave stuff, but even I think for Square Wave stuff, the original Blaster Master had some really great music in it. It also had some stuff in it that was okay and this and that. And I appreciate the fact that Blaster Master Zero 
didn't go the direction of, oh, well, we have to remake the Stage 1 theme. Oh, we have to remake the Stage 2 theme. There was definitely Stage 1 theme music in the Stage 1, but after that, it the music was completely doing its own thing. Um, and far as going long and going into all the places and getting all the power-ups and stuff, I felt like it was very entertaining for first time, maybe one time playthrough. I can see why my brother wouldn't like playing through it multiple times. I think I said this last week. And I don't, yeah, I hadn't beaten it by my recording last week. So, you know, I beat the game and again, I kind of really appreciate the direction. Like the music is just like, we're not going to try and remake the stage seven theme. Stage seven being one of the notable ones, like probably stage three being the most notable than seven and one maybe um but instead th they went a certain direction with the story that made sense where you're like okay instead of thinking of stage seven as the lava stage you're like uh this is the things are getting really dangerous stage and so the music kind of reflected that the level reflected that it was actually very different from the other levels while still keeping to a lot of the same themes from just the level organization from the original game. And the music was very earwormy and you know also have to appreciate the fact that the um, Blast Master Zero version of Stage 8 wasn't complete absolute garbage. Uh, the music, I mean. Like, it's it's not that the original Blast Masters is garbage, it's just that it's... Eh. So that, that one would be a very small example of Blast Masters Zero maybe having a better song than the original game, but... You know, it's it's all good, and it was a lot more manageable because Blastmaster Zero builds upon a lot of the same concepts from Blaster Master, but it's like, okay, we're going to give you more abilities. So, like, spikes aren't this instant death thing like they are in the original. You actually have a utility that you can use to get rid of them. Wall 2 isn't an instant death anymore because you have to explicitly turn it on instead of it just being always on, which, you know, it makes sense. The original game um, was built on a system that did not have a lot of buttons, so they wouldn't have been able to do as much with them. Um, and of course, you know, with the energy system oh, being the way it is, hover's actually useful a lot more than a couple of places where you're just like, yeah, I'm saving my energy for those couple of places, and I hope I don't mess them up. You don't have to worry about messing them up, you just have to be concerned about messing them up causing you to be slower and something, you know. It's all good. And I did get the um, full ending, because I did 100% the game. And that had some really interesting stuff it did as well. You know, overall, um, very pleased with Blast of Master Zero. Good job. Um, so, Monster Hunter Rise. So, um, I think the main thing to address is, you know, last time I said that I really didn't like the wire bug mechanic outside of battle, but for battle I did like it. And I... I think I, I don't remember specifically, but I would guess that I speculated that it might be different if I got the real game and actually got properly introduced to it. And that's pretty much what I found out. Um, I think the main two things it did was, first of all, um, the demo, of course, kind of just dumps you into the middle of a mission, which, you know, you could probably dig around and figure stuff out, but I didn't really like the fact... I, I guess... The demo kind of felt like you couldn't do that, and also that there was a lot of meaningless to doing stuff there. So, like, if you went exploring, you found this neat thing, that neat thing, um, you picked up this item or that item or whatever, then you're pretty much just memorizing the map, but there wouldn't be anything you could keep other than, you know, oh, well, maybe when I restart the game. And I'm not a person that likes to restart games. So, for me, it was just a bunch of information some of them which wasn't even given to us like what were the different combinations of buttons for wire bug stuff and there's some stuff that I just don't use because I don't get hit on my butt a whole lot I mean I do but I well eh, the point is um, when you're not limited to the time limit you're given proper instruction so basically when you go on a standard Monster Hunter 
tour, which allows you to just explore the new areas. And in this case, I'd say it's really recommended just because you're not going to memorize the areas, but you are going to get a better feel for the areas in general and major overarching places. So that when you are chasing monsters, you're like, oh, I probably have to go in a cave that's not as obviously marked on the map as I would think it should be. You know, you'd have little things like that, but when you're going out about and exploring, that's pretty much like your video game equivalent to um, childhood games of Tag or Peekaboo or something. You know, we think of them as kind of simple, but at the same time, they teach valuable skills such as um, so like Tag would teach you running and evading and Peekaboo is a you know kind of a game that you play that slowly teaches object permeance I would say I mean I think you'd pick that up anyways but I think you know babies kind of enjoy it because you know that's a new novel idea and that's the thing is you know you pick up these basic skills by doing little fun things and going on um, a world tour where you're gathering a bunch of material and you're like okay I'm gonna need this that that and this you know that pretty much gives you a better opportunity to just sit down and say okay I really want to go up there how the fuck do I get up there and you just have better ability experience it the other thing is um the demo also had a lot of great wire bugs automatically set up for you so you it seemed like the people I was playing with were doing navigation based on those as opposed to just kind of general exploratory so I kind of felt like there was too many mechanics in the way as opposed to stuff being built up which just happens naturally playing the real game so now that I've done that and now I've played on five different maps I have to say that you know the wire bug mechanic is actually much more fun for environment navigation and that's because you really can you really can get that open world feel it's not completely open world but the entire map is open map I guess like, some, some of this stuff makes me wonder how Monster Hunter World actually worked, because I never played it, and I don't know how it adjusted the mechanics, but it kind of feels like there's a lot of Monster Hunter World inspiration going on in this game. But I can only say feels like it, because I don't know if that's actually the case, because I don't know the details of how everything has changed between these versions and what Monster Hunter World actually did. All I know is, you know, I go out there, it definitely, the maps are big enough such that you feel like you're doing a kind of open world exploration of the maps. I'm getting used to moving around them pretty quick and, well, relatively quick, I would say, rather. And, you know, just overall building up an understanding of the game. And at the same time, it's really interesting that there's a lot of things that they've streamlined so that it's not as grindy. Which is for the best because I think people will spend more time out and about just being out and about, just hanging out in these wildernesses as opposed to, oh, well, I need to hug this one plant and harvest it uh, five or six times or something. You, you'll, you'll just like harvest it once and most of them are just whoop, and I grabbed my three or four things from it. You know, the game's a lot more generous with a lot of that stuff. Um, the ingredients required to craft some of the basic stuff have been very simplified. So, like, it used to be that you need to, needed to use herb and blue mushroom in order to create potions. But now it's just herbs. And the game's set up so that um, these stuff can be automatically crafted. So that if you only had five potions at the start of a map and you grabbed uh, two herbs, they would automatically be crafted into two potions. Poof. Just instant like that. Um, and I think if you grabbed honey, then those potions would poof be instantly crafted into mega potions if you had space for those. So the game definitely encourages you to kind of construct a lot more material on the fly. Um, the polymutes, of course, are very nice for did it additional movement and stuff, but I'm going away from my primary thought, which is that you know the ingredients have been simplified for a lot of this stuff. Um, the requirement to juggle additional inventory seems to be less needed. What I mean is, like normally in order to mine um, minerals, you just you have to have a pickaxe with you and you have to construct multiple pickaxes because you're going to break one or two eventually. And you know you just take them with you on every mission or something because you're going to mine some 
or while you just happen to be out and about. Um, but you don't need to, because your character just always has a pickaxe that, you know, they never show. They always have a, um, you don't have to collect whetstones, which is probably not as big of an advantage for people that don't use swords, but it means that for people with swords, you know, you just always have a whetstone. You always have a barbecue spit, so, um, you know, you don't have to carry that around extra with you, and I was, you know, I was spending some time trying to figure out how I get one, and I'm like, oh, I had one the whole time. Um, you also don't need to construct bug nets. It does not seem like they're doing hot drink, cold drink. In fact, a lot of the um, the crafting list tree seems to be mostly simplified. I mean, there's still plenty of stuff on there, but it's just like, for some of the stuff, it's... Well, half of them are ammo, and as a longsword user, I just ignore those anyways, but... You know, a lot of stuff on there just seems to be whatever it is. And it'll be interesting playing with my brother again, because I haven't set up things like, oh, let's get some scatterfish farms. In fact, I haven't done any fishing at all yet. I really should. I guess you didn't need fishing equipment before. Uh, the armor stuff has definitely been simplified in, I think, a good way. Maybe in a couple of different ways. I'm... Not entirely sure if... So I haven't been noticing a longsword versus bowgunner version of a lot of armor. And I'm mostly thinking that... Because, um, you know, I've just been looking at armor as armor, and even though I've seen multiple things listed confusingly, I've... Um, never seen anything that tells me that there are two different versions of the armors and maybe I'm just missing another button somewhere in there but for the most part you know it means um, it looks pretty straightforward and the abilities do seem to range between gunner and non gunner stuff so you know, you know I'll, I'll get an armor I'm like oh, I guess I'm not gonna use that armor because all the skills seem to be only gutter, gunner specific. I think, uh, I was gonna say Berioth, maybe one. You know, good classic returning monster that's very aggressive and pointy. Um, and the abilities don't seem to be, okay, we're just going to be adding numbers together and you have to make sure you have numbers that add up to 10 and 15 and, oh, you made it to 14 on this one. Well, too bad. It's not gonna be the thing you want it to be. Instead, uh, armors just seem to have abilities and they get better if they get stacked and so there's this kind of, oh, well, I guess if I want to focus on, like, offense, then I'm going to go with these combination of armors because they add to critical eye and attack. And I'm a, a fan of critical eye just because the affinity boost, if I remember correctly, is a chance to just do a critical hit, which doesn't do double damage per se, but something like that. That. I don't know. So, you know, ba basically, all that stuff. And it's interesting because the game also seems to be juggling way more information than previous Monster Hunter games, but at the same time, giving you better utilities to um, process and deal with all of that. Like, not, not with absolutely everything in the game. For example, um, every single map has ten um, secret messages in there, and there's nothing that really tells you where those are. You could probably look at online guides, because you can look in your notes and figure out which ones you have and which ones you're missing. And somewhere out there, someone probably has something that tells you, oh, yes, in the Shrine Ruins, these are the locations of the ten things, and you can just go through the list and say, yeah, and now I've got all ten. That's something I may eventually do, but I'm not focusing on that right now. But, you know, when it comes to things like, oh, well... There's a billion places you could go to mine things, so how do I figure out how to get um, herbs? I want to get specifically herbs for some reason. Yeah, because by the time you're figuring this information out, you will have already, um, you know, probably figured out that you'll, you'll be okay for herbs for a while. Um, but yeah, you can go into your detailed map and you can actually limit it down so that instead of showing absolutely everything on the map, you're just seeing where herbs specifically are on the map. So 
the maps are actually really useful. The monster information gives you a lot of information about where weaknesses are. I don't remember if the previous games did that, but I did remember seeing most of that information online, whereas now it's in the game, which is pretty good. And when you attack, you see damage, so you can kind of, as you're going, you get a better feel for, oh, yeah, so I want to whop this guy on the head as much as I can, because that seems to be doing twice as much damage as tickling the toes. And, you know, the subquests are not now no longer tied to um, the quest you're doing. In fact, they're not even tied to quests at all, per se. Um, now, now you've got the requests and the subquests, and you can just have those queued up, and you could have many of those going on at the same time, and somehow the game makes it pretty easy to keep track of absolutely all of that. The closest I got to not doing that was forgetting that, oh, yeah, I'm doing this one um, quest to upgrade the food shop, and I forgot that I was on a time limit, and I was like, oh, yeah, this Basarios is um, not going to die anytime soon, because longsword Basarios are not a very good mix. Although they did make some things about it a little easier, and that's interesting. Um... The point, the point is, you know, I kind of had to break away and say, oh yeah, I gotta take care of these last few other things and then take care of that. But, you know, that that was just me kind of forgetting that I wasn't there on a world tour just battling a monster that happened to be there. I was just kind of doing that because it was my second time playing the map and I was getting used to it. And, you know, it was just fine. It was fun. And then, you know... The game's very fair with giving you information. So when it sends you out to hunt for something, it doesn't just shaft you and say, yeah, I, I hope you explored the absolute entirety of this map and know it. And it's interesting because it might be that in um, high rank, maybe they don't show that stuff. I don't, I don't know what high rank's going to be like because, um, you know, I'm not there yet. I'm... I'm so, one, two of my weaknesses for Monster Hunters. First of all, since I started playing with Longsword and only ever played Longsword, that means that at this point, when I think of Monster Hunter, I think of Longsword. So, I'm I'm kind of stuck using Longsword. And I, I enjoy my time. So, you don't worry about it for my sake. You worry about it for everybody else. Like, uh, but we wanted to bring four gunners on this mission. Yeah, sorry, I don't gunner. And the other problem is I tend not to play on multiplayer. So, like, I've only been playing single-player on my own, and this usually means that my story progression is fine, whatever, but my game progression is a bit slower. And in this case, I think it was a little warranted just because I really needed to get used to the new mechanics and the new maps and all that stuff, but, you know, this does mean that, you know, I haven't made any progress on the multiplayer stuff, and normally, if you'd put as much time as I have into this game into the multiplayer side of it, you might, you'd not only probably be high rank by now, but you'd probably be a little into it. But, you know, that's a big, uh, that, that's just one of my weaknesses. But it's interesting that, you know, last night I discovered that if you go far enough in the single player stuff, then eventually you get a special kind of urgent request that allows you to advance in rank, um, on the multiplayer side. So I'm HR2, even though normally I would just, be HR1 forever and ever until I finally did my first multiplayer stuff with people. Which is going to happen tomorrow with co-workers, hopefully. But, you know, the, that's all a bunch of stuff. It's, like, been a fun game, great game. And again, you know, it's really nice that it feels like they've streamlined a whole lot of stuff so that I'd say it's more approachable from a, oh, am I going to be grinding? So there may still be grinding, but at this point it may actually be the kind of grinding that's the kind that, mon that has made Monster Hunter great. You know, the, let's all wrestle that dinosaur! You know, that's usually Monster Hunter's high point. That and, you know, the enemy movements have always been great, but, um, in this case, they've even updated some of the movements, so it's not the same one they've been using for a billion years, I think. There's a little more fluidness and movement and little things. Uh, you know, they, they did a good job on that part of the polish, I would say. At least for the handful of monsters I've seen. There's only been like a dozen or so, but... Good stuff. Enjoying my time. Definitely looking forward to, um... seeing what it will be like with multiplayer now that I've 
got a character that's my own and not some, oh, here you go, we just dumped this character on you and hope you enjoy them and it seems like this monster's taking a long time to die, is it just me or... And, you know, I'll, I'll probably find out if, um, you know, maybe that experience is still the same and maybe that means multiplayer might not be much more fun because usually multiplayer is fun because you have four hunt hunters jump on a monster and chop it up. But anyways, lots and lots of things to talk about and obviously this has been a reason why I've not watched more anime. You know, there's always an excuse some week, but that's been the reason. And, you know, it's still going to be a thing because I want to make sure I'm at least comfortably set up. I really hope my brother's able to get the game. I mean, I really want his girlfriend to get it, too, because, you know, the two of them together are pretty fun. But, you know, I, I miss my brother and playing Monster Hunter with him. So here's hoping that we'll be able to. But I don't know what tonight's going to be like because they don't have the game yet. So... I guess we'll have to find out. Maybe some of y'all don't care, but yeah, because very few people watch the stream, and that's okay. Anyways, y'all have a nice week.